Wow, it's amazing that somebody walks up to the microphone and there's quiet. <laughs> well, first, uh, welcome for, welcome, uh, thank you for all being here. Welcome to Cal State Bakersfield, uh, or should that be California State University Bakersfield? I see the yes for the correct uh, 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 words we're supposed to be using. Um, I want to especially thank those of you that are coming from off campus because this is, can be a trek depending on where you are in town. Um, and I also especially want to thank the students for a couple of reasons. I want to thank you first for helping fund because some of, one of the sponsors is ASI IRA. And without your, without your fees that go into this, um, we, we simply couldn't do it. And it is really our goal to provide for students the opportunity to, to have an engaging intellectual environment. And these are the kinds of things outside of the classrooms that, that do speak to that, that do try to, to get at that. And even though some of you students may simply be coming for uh, extra credit, the hope is that you will come out learning something, which I know you will, and, uh, and really you know, thinking about the world around you a little bit differently. Uh, maybe it will energize you to become active in politics or in your community in some way. So thank you. I uh, also want to thank the, uh, the sponsors. And the sponsors include the Kegley Institute for Ethics. So thank you very much, Michael Burroughs, who is the director of the, of the, of the KIE. Uh, Dr. Miriam Vivian, who is the director of the Public History Institute. Um, also, uh, the uh, Office of the Provost, which has also supported us, and the Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities, uh, Dr. Bob Frakes. I'm so glad that you are here. There was also funding from the uh, Latino faculty, Latina Latino Faculty and Staff Association, for, so thank you for that, and of course, the, the students. I also want to thank the Walter Stern Library. Uh, Dean Kurt Asher has been so generous in allowing us to use really what we, I think we all agree on campus, is the most beautiful room on, on campus. And as I've said before in past introductions, the library really is the heart and soul of the university. Uh, and, uh, and so it's really fitting to be able to have uh, these kinds of uh, lectures and discussions. Uh, some of you, I think, I, I saw you on Wednesday at the debate uh, among the, the supervisorial candidates for that, for that new district. So I was glad to see uh, so many people here. Um, I also want to thank Donato Cruz, who is an intern, a graduate student intern uh, with the Historical Research Center, and he is going to be videotaping today, and so he's done wonderful work. Uh, I, I go up there, and he shows me what they've done. How do you do this? Um, and uh, so a lot of people really put in a lot of effort to pull this together, and I want to thank all of them. Uh, I also want to remind you that we envision this, this talk as part of National Hispanic Hes History Month, and it is the last thing on the official, can on the, on the official calendar. So it, you know, there was, uh, I think we've had last month, a really, really uh, vibrant schedule, all kinds of activities going on, and uh, I thank all the people that have put so much into that. Uh, this, Today's lecture is technically under the umbrella of the social science, uh, social science program, social science speaker series. And it was really kind of a way to, to pull in some speakers, a history forum for which I think probably 16 years I was on that committee in one way or another, uh, had, had a slate that they were bringing, but thought this would be a, a good opportunity uh, this was right after the uh, Luna decision came down, and so we thought it would be a, a really wonderful addition because it does speak to what the social science program and what a lot of programs on campus aim to do. Um, and the social science program in particular is an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary program that uh, students that are following that program, they are typically history majors or poli-sci majors, 
And they are following that program um, in which they have to take econ, history, uh, poli-sci, some uh, religious studies. Their, their goal is to be subject matter certified in the eyes of the state of California and teach at the high school and junior high school level. Uh, and this really does fit. This also fits with the other programs, the other sponsors. Uh, Kegley, for example, Institute of Ethics, because I, this, this, this uh, topic really does speak to broader issues in society. And of course, the Public History Institute, because this is public history. Uh, and I do like to remind students that history really is a living discipline. It really is. It's not just a list of names and dates, things that happened, and it's all fixed forever. It is a living, dis living discipline, and I think uh, 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 Dr. Camarillo's uh, talk is going to illustrate that. Um, I am so pleased to be able to introduce Dr. Albert Camarillo. He is Leon Sloss, Jr., Memorial Professor Emeritus from Stanford University. He, let's see if I can put this down without messing everything up. He earned his BA from the University of California, at Los Angeles. His PhD from the University of California at Los Angeles. And he was appointed to the faculty of the Department of History at Stanford University in 1975. He's published and, or, and co-edited eight books, over three dozen articles dealing with the experience of Mexican Americans and other racial and immigrant groups in American cities. He's widely regarded as one of the founders of the field of Mexican-American history and Chicano studies. Uh, over the course of his career, he's received many, many awards and fellowships, including a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship and a Rockefeller Foundation Fellowship. He is also a fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences, uh, the Huntington Library, which I understand is the scholar's heaven, uh, and, uh, and the Stanford University Humanities Center. His awards for teaching and service at Stanford are numerous. He is the only faculty member in the history of Stanford University to receive the six highest awards in excellence in, for excellence in teaching, service to undergraduate education and Stanford alumni, and university-related public service. Uh, I could go on, but that would take about you know, another 10 or 15 minutes that we really want to save for your talk. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn things over to our distinguished speaker, Professor Albert Camarillo. Thank you, Alicia, and I want to thank uh, the long list of co-sponsors for this event. So all, all of the programs and the library and other, other uh, institutes, uh, many thanks for the invitation to, uh, to come to uh, CSU Bakersfield, but especially for Professor Rodriguez because she's the one that extended the initial invitation and did all the logistics. Um, <laughs> And it takes a lot. I know I've done, done this many times myself. It takes a lot of work to actually bring someone to campus. So greatly appreciated. And thank you to you all. I was telling my wife, who's sitting up here too, I'm amazed how many people are in this room. You could provide wine and cheese on a Friday afternoon, and three people would come to a Stanford event at this time. So the fact that you're here, I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> well, there, there's no wine and cheese, but, you know. <laughs> well, your county has been in the news starting last year and then ramping up earlier this year. Print media, down, of course, local newspapers, Los Angeles Times, feature article, San Francisco Chronicle, feature article. There's going to be a program on KCET, public television in Los Angeles, which will focus on issues of voting rights and gerrymandering. And one of the featured segments within that program on the 23rd of this month will be Kern County. So you've gotten a lot of, how many of you have followed 
the Luna case. Or I've heard about it, read about it, so many, if not most of you, right? You have the plaintiff, so on, on your left top is uh, Tom Sines, the president, general counsel of the um, Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, which were the counsels to the plaintiffs. And the bottom, your the right the corner, the defendants, the Kern County Board of Supervisors. Right? Well, what I want to talk about today uh, are these, these five points. I want, to, I want to talk about what was the nature of this U.S. District Court case, a voting rights case. There were legal foundations, to be sure. We have to understand what the Voting Rights Act was about and what it still is today, so I'll talk a little bit about that. But there are important historical foundations as well, which I want to talk about. And this, the, third, the fourth point, the power of, um, of history and law, with regard to this particular case, to Bakersfield, to Kern County, to places like Delano and Taft, and all of the communities and municipalities within the county, um, I'm going to give you a variety of examples that are embedded in this court case because history plays a very important role. Most people don't realize that, that in a voting rights case, history? Yes, yes indeed. And so I want to, I want to give you um, part of that history, just some examples from the report that I submitted to the court on behalf of the plaintiff. And then lastly, I'll finish off with just some personal perspectives. Luna. So you have Oscar Luna, Alicia Puentes, Dorothy Velasquez, and Gary uh, Rodriguez representing Hispanic Latino voters in Kern County. And they're taking on the Kern County Board of Supervisors. So the plaintiffs on behalf of Latino voters throughout the county are basically saying to the Kern County Board of Supervisors that the supervisorial districts that were established in 2011 are affecting their ability to vote and to elect candidates of choice. That becomes very important. So the district boundaries are absolutely critical to understanding the case. So the legal counsel, MALDEF, sorry for that extra G in, that, in the MALDEF, um, sues on behalf in support of the plaintiff, sues Kern County for the violation of the Federal Voting Rights Act. Okay, and I'm going to give you some background on that. So um, it's a complicated act. Um, anytime there's, there's major legislation, um, federal legislation, um, it changes over time, it becomes very complicated, and so I'll try to sort out what, what are the critical factors to consider as this case went forward. And it's a basically a claim that the boundaries that were drawn violated the constitutional rights uh, of Latino voters in the, the county of Kern. Um, every, just to back up a little bit, every 10 years, you know, we do the decennial census. And from that, every political jurisdiction in America, from municipalities to counties to the state government to school districts, often in the case as well, redraw or maintain existing boundaries for voting. Right? And so the plaintiffs in this case, supported by Maldives, said the district boundary drawn by the Board of Supervisors in 2010, it's really problematic. So it becomes about maps. It's a deal, it's an issue about maps, right? It's very important how those boundaries are drawn. And you see the map here, established and affirmed and confirmed by the Kern County Board of Supervisors in 2011. Again, based on the 2010 census, drawn pretty much what it had looked like before, maintaining the status quo. And that is pretty common, right? So incumbents in whatever political jurisdiction, and you know, it's common sense. You're gonna try to protect your district. So let's maintain the status quo. But when that status quo 
begins to infringe on the right of citizens of a particular class, a particular group, then there are issues. And so it is about a map, but it's far, far more than that. It's a contemporary U.S. District Court case that reaches back into history. History hundreds of years old. Generations, certainly decades when it comes to the Voting Rights Act. And for the Voting Rights Act per se, clearly it was focused first and foremost on the legacies of Jim Crow in the American South and African Americans. Explicitly, that was the intent to break that lock on the ballot box for African Americans in the South, as it should be, right? One of the core issues of the civil rights movement, of the black freedom struggle. The Voting Rights Act uh, was absolutely critical to achieving the goals, the twin goals of, of the, of, of the uh, civil rights movement, black enfranchisement. All right, so I said the intent of the Voting Rights Act was for African Americans. It was, but there was a very another, there was another very large minority, the second largest racial minority in the United States in a different region of the United States where this important piece of legislation was gonna pertain. I'll come back to that. Jim Crow, I, we, we, know, we know about Jim Crow, it's in our U.S. history books, our high school students read about Jim Crow. You'll see the signs, right, the signs of, of Jim Crow uh, everywhere. Um, and it, in several of these photos will be in those history books. So Americans generally know about Jim Crow, right? Um, when it comes to voting, these are, these are artifacts now as we look back at them, but they were the means by which you disenfranchise an entire class of people, an entire race of people in a region of the United States. Your upper left there is a, from Birmingham, Alabama, it is a poll tax. One of the many devices that the Voting Rights Act makes illegal. In Birmingham, Alabama, and this is 1890, I'm not sure, I cut off the date. You had to pay $1.50 to go vote. You might, if you were African American in Birmingham in 1895, let's say, you were lucky if you made $1.50 a week. Are you going to spend $1.50 to register to vote when it's not gonna have any meaning anyway? Absolutely not, but it was an important device. Grandfather clause. If your grandfather was held in servitude, sorry, you can't vote. Another device was putting, you know, making that lock even tighter on, on that ballot box for African Americans. The literacy test, an, another one. And I'm gonna give you an example of this because uh, some years ago, one of my colleagues, long retired now from the political science department uh, at Stanford, African American, well known, um, nationally known political scientist, his name's Lucius Barker, uh, told several of us a story, which relates to this liter literacy test. Well, here's an anecdote out of Lucius's past. All right, Lucius, born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, got an undergraduate degree from a um, local university, and then went on to graduate school at the University of Illinois. Not many African Americans in 1951 and 52 uh, achieved a level of uh, academic uh, achievement that Lucius did. He was trained as a constitutional scholar. He goes back home to register in 1952, in summer, uh, on break from, from school. And he goes to the registrar of voters in Baton Rouge and says, I wanna vote. And they say, can you read this? This is the state constitution, literacy test first. If you can't read, you can't vote. You can't register to vote. He reads it, no, of course, quickly. Guy's kind of surprised. There's a young African American who can read. All right, can you tell me, can you interpret what these, this part of the Constitution, yes, this is the 14th, the 15th Amendment, 14th Amendment established in 19, 1870, at, uh, equal protection, he goes on and on, so the guy is flabbergasted, right? All right, all right, he says to Lucius, your, was your grandfather a slave? 
Lucius pulls out his grandfather's birth certificate. He was a free black man. The guy's exasperated. He doesn't know what to do. Here's this guy. He reads. He can interpret. Knows way more about the state constitution, the U.S. Constitution, than the guy at the polling um, uh, place in the county. What does he decide to do? Sorry, it's lunchtime. You come back later. Regardless, so that anecdote shows you that regardless if you could meet the provisions of voting, you were not going to be allowed to vote if you were black and in the South. And then intimidation. Imagine going to a polling station as an African American and seeing the effigy saying, um, this nigger voted. Can you imagine how intimidating that would, would you even go near a voting booth? Hell no. So the idea of being able to be a full citizen as an African American was hitting you in the face at every step, especially if you wanted to exercise your franchise. Voting Rights Act then was between the 1964 Civil Rights Act, right, which was going to prohibit discrimination on the basis of race. And then the year later, in 1965, the Voting Rights Act, which was going to make illegal all those things Lucius Barker had encountered and way more, right, way more. So it was an enormous achievement of the civil rights movement to have both the 64 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act, those two twin pillars of the civil rights movement. So they were absolutely important for enforcing uh, the 14th and 15th Amendments for all Americans, African Americans in particular. Um, there are many, many provisions. I mean, I, I can't even begin to explain if we even had two, three-hour seminar, the, the complexities of the Voting Rights Act, but they're, they're important things to understand. Um, it's going to prohibit, especially under Section 2 at the local and state level, all of those mechanisms that had been put in place in the South and other places that prevented American citizens from being able to cast their vote and have and, 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 you, and exercise their franchise as American citizens. And of course, over time, it was, had to be reauthorized every five years. And in the course of those reauthorization, the US Senate amended uh, bits and pieces of it over time. So I won't go, I won't get into that because it, it, is, it is quite complex, but um, we will talk about two of the provisions. All right, let's return to the question of Mexican Americans. So I've coined a phrase, which I've written about, and now for the first time, it's actually in legal casework because the US District Court Judge Droz actually referred to Jaime Crow. What do I mean about Jaime Crow? Jim Crow had a nasty little cousin, and his name was Jaime. And he caused a lot of bad feelings and hurt feelings and systematic segregation and systematic discrimination against the nation's second largest minority from Texas to California. Unlike Jim Crow, rarely codified by law, by statute, by legislation, but no less effective, no less pervasive, no less demeaning when it's based on historical and cultural practice. It's just the way folks did things, right? This is the way society was organized. And it was a system of segregation, a system of exclusion that was ubiquitous. In education, in housing, in recreation, uh, and in voting. Now again, you've seen signs of Jim Crow. I may be introducing you for the first time to signs of Jaime Crow. In Texas and in places like Southern California, all throughout the Southwest, you saw signs like this. This is out of South Texas. Este baño solamente para americanos. This bath is only for Americans. If you're a Tejano, a Spanish-speaking, Mexican origin um, Texan, you knew what americano meant. It didn't mean citizenship. It meant white. You should not use this bathroom, right? Jim Crow, Jaime Crow, related. How about this one? We serve whites only, no Spanish or Mexicans. 
in a restaurant, in a barber shop, other places, right? Again, these signs were ubiquitous through the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, into the 1950s, well documented, right? Again, these, these images have not um, entered into U.S. history high school textbook, not yet. They will, but, but not quite yet. Selma, Alabama? No. Meridian, Mississippi? No. Macon, Georgia? No. Santa Barbara, California, 1923. There were five blacks, and that's the Ku Klux Klan had not organized its white supremacy agenda in Santa Barbara against blacks. The only group and a very substantial group were Mexican origin people. Right? So Jaime Crow, domestic terrorism. South Texas town, this is the American school. Small South Texas town where the majority of people and the, the large majority of the students are of Mexican origin. Mexican only school. Regardless of the color of your skin, whether you could speak English or not, you had to go to that school. So the effects of Jaime Crow were pervasive and widespread. That picture on your upper left, that is Hoover School in the Westminster School District in Orange County in 1947, which was the site of one of the first successful racial desegregation school cases called Mendes versus Westminster. And in that school and throughout uh, Orange County, 5,000 Mexican children by custom, not by law, by practice, not by educational statute, had to go to Mexican-only schools or classrooms. Signs, Do no dogs, Negroes, and Americans. Now you probably can't read the bottom of that. That says the Lone Star Restaurant Association. This is the 1920s in Texas. If you were a member restaurant of this restaurant association, you had to put this sign in the window of the restaurant everywhere. When you talk to the old veteranos, the old timers, some of them you know, long gone now, I'd, I had an opportunity to talk to some of these people that lived through Jaime Crow. Yes, indeed, they, they remember, with real pain in their hearts too, right? They remember um, how intimidating and how painful it was to see these signs everywhere. Or you went to the park, and this was true of California too, the sign, uh, this park was given for white people and Mexicans and Negroes stay out. So it, well, Jaime Crow was everywhere, and it had such destructive effects and legacies. So let's move to Kern County. So let me return to that question of the Voting Rights Act and why would history be an important part of a court case determining whether a contemporary boundary, district boundary established by a political entity, why history would be important? Well, in 1982, when the Senate Judiciary Committee did some tweaking of the, of the Voting Rights Act, it, uh, it added a series, actually nine provisions, nine factors that were to give legal counsel for both plaintiffs and defendants everywhere that voting rights would be considered. Uh, they had to look at these facts to determine whether there were violations of this act or not. So there were nine factors uh, I'll, I'll mention two here the historical part of them. Number one, that the history of official discrimination in the jurisdiction the, uh, that affects the right to vote of an aggrieved party. Um, I give the example of racial gerrymandering. The cutting up of districts to, as they say, dilute uh, or to uh, reduce the political influence of a particular group. And then number five, and this was important too, because it lays out a much bigger context. The extent to which the jurisdictions minorities are discriminated against in socioeconomic areas such as education, employment, and health. This is verbatim from the Voting Rights Act Section 2, uh, uh, Senate Factors 2. 
Other factors, there's, again, there's many other factors that any case of voting rights will take into consideration. I mentioned a few here. Is there racially polarized jurisdiction and voting going on in this district? Are there what they call racial appeals um, in campaigns? Or have, has there been in the past and currently um, elected officials who seem to be um, not very responsive to the political interests of particular sectors of the population. So these are all factored in. And then lastly, very importantly, and you'll see why in a minute, the Senate factors say it's not just the history in the local jurisdiction. It's the history of a region because the trends that affect local history are very important. So it's not, for example, just Kern County. It's not just Baker Bakersfield. It's not just Kern County. It could be all of Southern California. It can be all of California. It can be the entire Southwest where Mexican Americans as the historically the largest uh, ethnic group have resided historically, right? So the local and the regional, the state, the, the larger uh, region of, of, a, of a country, they, it's very important in these cases and you'll see why. So I have to go about as an expert witness, and all of these voting rights cases have expert witness who are historians. Right? So uh, Professor Rodriguez's point about how history can be used, well, in, in the case of voting rights cases, it is actively used. And I'm going to give you some examples um, from my testimony uh, in a few minutes and the judge's reaction to both me and the opposing counsel. So as a historian, I'm going to try to set historical context that goes back to the 19th century, the creation of Mexican Americans as a population after me the Mexican War. I'm not going to dwell on this, but as a result of that war and the Americanization of California and the American Southwest, um, I can actually point to laws that had real devastating impact on the rights of Mexican Americans as citizens. I'll give you a couple examples. 1894, California legislature enacts uh, a language provision to vote. If you can't read, if, if you can't speak and read some, uh, something in English, you can't vote. For a long time, it basically eliminated a very large Chinese American population, a relatively small Mexican American population, but one that was going to increase over time. Another example, just throw out another example. Um, it was called the Greaser Law in the early 1850s. Euphemistically called the Greaser Law, right? Enacted by the California legislature. It didn't allow loitering of Mexicans on Sunday. Yeah, you might go to the cantina, have a, you know, whatever you might have, a tequilazo, whatever you're drinking then. Um, and hang out like you've been hanging out for a long time around the placita, right? Illegal, you put in jail. Right? So there were laws I could go back to. Now I'm not saying those laws are still intact, but they set the context of what in the 20th century becomes high micro. Another thing for Kern County, and uh, Professor Rodriguez knows this well because she's written about um, the Ku Klux Klan in the county. And it's not just Kern. It's up and down the state of California. It expands out of the west, out of the, so out of the south, to the west and other parts of the country in the early 20th century, especially in the 1920s. And it takes hold in a lot of communities, not just Kern County, but there is a, a KKK. Why? There's no 19th century legacy of a Mexican community in, in Kern County, right? The only folks that were traveling through here uh, were indigenous populations, native peoples. So it's not until the second half of the 19th century that Kern County becomes settled, right? And interesting things happen in the last quarter of the 19th century. As radical reconstruction and re federal reconstruction of the American South occurs, there is an increasing population of Southerners former slaveholders, some plantation owners that come out west. 
We've done demographic analyses of the 1920s and 1930s, and in Kern County and Fresno County, between 20% and 30% of all people not born in California and those counties were from the South and from border states. Now, you have to make the leap. They're coming from the South. They're dissatisfied what's going on in the South. They're trying to what pick up again their agricultural economy in a different place. But some of them, not all of them, I'm not making a claim that all of these people brought with them the culture of white supremacy, but a lot of them did and transplanted it. It's one of the reasons we can explain there was a lot of support for the KKK because of a southern cultural tradition about race. But there weren't a whole lot of black, black folk in Kern County in the 1920s. But there was an increasing number of Mexicans and some Asians as well, a few blacks. What really begins to upset the racial hierarchy in a place like Kern in Southern California and, and California agriculture uh, and Texas agriculture, Arizona agriculture, is the mass migration of immigrants from Mexico, the first, what we call the first great wave that came in the period from about 1910 to 1930. A million of them, right? Tenth of the entire population of Mexico comes to places like Texas and California. And they come at a time when the foundation of Kern County and so many other places in these states, agriculture, are firmly being planted and prospering. And there's, there's a need for a vast army of workers. And over the course of the teens and the 20s and 30s, Mexicans become the largest group of workers in an agricultural economy that is bifurcated, one, by race and by socioeconomic level, right? And there's a lot of tension there. There's a lot of tension there, especially when the agricultural workers begin to unionize in the 20s especially the 30s, the greatest agricultural strikes in American history. Yes, they occurred in the 1960s nearby, right, with the United Farm Workers, but before that, in the field, the cotton fields of Kern County and, and adjacent counties, with literally tens of thousands of workers that were organizing. Well, they didn't have a lot of support. There was an enormous violence against people who were organizing unions of farm workers, right? So this is increasing kind of tension. It was both racial tension and a class tension that evolves through the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and 60s. And we have to explain what happens with UFW, United Farm Workers, and Sacha Chavez, and Dolores Huerta uh, in the fields of Delano and other places. It, it, it's part of a much larger historical context, right? And then the historical context, again, if we go back to Jaime Crow, it's going to seep into so many places, it seeps into housing discrimination, right? 1928, the first survey of race and housing in the state of California is conducted by some researchers from the Department of Sociology out of the University of Chicago. They want to kind of get a sense, what's going on in California's race relations? So they send a survey out to every realty board in the state of California, up and down the state of California, asking them some questions about how do you deal with your racial minorities. I'm going to show you this survey. This is from the city of Bakersfield, so here we are. Edward Kelly, who was the president of the Realty Board at that time in 1928, and the survey question asked, are there segregated sections in your locality based on the color line? They actually used the color line. Kelly says, yes, Negroes, Chinese, Japanese, Mexicans, and any others not of the Cauca white or Caucasian race. No local ordinance, he said. Residential segregation was enforced through subdivision restrictions, real estate race-related restrictions, which become ubiquitous by the 1920s, and custom only. Customary practice. No law, right? No law, but customary practice and deed restrictions. Survey question, in your judgment, how can this important problem be handled by real estate interests? Uh, Mr. Kelly says, for the realtor to be sincere and not sell to the Chinese, the Japanese, Negroes, and Mexicans, unless it is in their section of the locality and where they should be. And in Bakersfield, it was southeast Bakersfield, outside the city limits where African Americans and Mexicans and the few Chinese and Japanese were allowed to live. Jaime Crow. 
housing ads I took from the Californian. So by mid-century, the race-related segregation of housing was stark. I remember those of you that know the name Luis Valdez, really very famous um, Mexican-American playwright, um, motion picture director, producer. Uh, he, he, we, I had him into one of my classes, and when he came to Delano for the first time with his family from Texas, the first thing he said, it was, it was like I was in the South. Like I was, there was, it was, he said it was like black and white, except there wasn't black, it was Mexican and white, right? He's talking about the stark separation of people based upon national origin, ethnicity, and race. East Delano understood it was white. You could not get, even if you had the mean student, if you were Mexican American, few blacks that lived in West, West, you could not buy in West and East Delano. You were expected to live in West Delano. That's just the way it was. It was Jaime Crow. These ads here, I'll, I'll show you. Here's a close up of these ads. Two bedroom home, this is from um, Bakersfield, California in 1954. Two bedroom home, unfurnished, one mile east on 99 on White Lane, one mile south, whites only. Now, I don't know if it's a coincidence that that lane, um, a mile south um, or a mile north on, on 99 was White Lane for a reason. I looked at a map. There are no brown lanes or black avenues. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, so it's probably coincidence. Or this one from 1959. Two-bedroom home in Oildale Oil duplex on Bernard Street. Suitable for Spanish. Euphemism. Mexicans only. Or this, I got out of a 1941 um, Californian article. North of the River Homeowners Association. Uh, quote, favoring racial restrictions for residential areas north of Kern County, and they asked the coordinating council of the, H of the HOA, the Homeowners Association, uh, to help in, launch, quote, unquote, launching plans to exclude all races but those favored from the area. So race restrictions, right? Ubiquitous, common. It's simply understood. Everyone would abide by this because that's the way it was. You ever heard the term sundown towns? They're mostly associated with the South and the border states um, uh, near the South, and they targeted African Americans primarily. I never found one so far that targeted Mexican Americans, but this one, here's the, the, the sign that you see. That's the typical sundown sign that would be usually on a city limit. Don't let the sun set on you here understand. In the Taft city limits in the 1930s, the sign read, read, nigger, and run. If you can't read, run anyway. Nigger, don't let the sun go down on you in Taft. You knew, and as this young African-American who worked for the Civilian Conservation Corps who was traveling through and they were going to stop for lunch, he said, uh-uh, guys, we're not stopping here. Um, when you saw this sign, you knew your life was in jeopardy if you stopped and the sun set on you, sundown towns. So local history again, the legacies of Jaime Crow that are being contested by the 50s and 60s and into the 70s. Um, the parents in Bakersfield, uh, the Bakersfield City School District, and in the Delano Elementary School District um, seek the help of the state of California, and first for Bakersfield, joined by the U.S. Office of Civil Rights, and this is the first time that the state of California will join the feds in a lawsuit on the basis of educational segregation. It was on the basis of the segregation of both African Americans and Mexican American kids in your city schools. And the LA Times reported that the state filed suit against Bakersfield schools, charging that they were among the most segregated in California. It made sense for Mexican Americans and African American parents and their civil rights oriented organizations to try to knock down those barriers of high micro, especially in their schools, because they knew the schools were so important to the future of their children. Same thing happened in Delano with the Peña case a couple years later. 
Mexican Americans, they're overwhelmingly Mexican Americans on the west side of Delano. The, the elementary schools in Delano were 97, 98, and 98 percent, the three schools, Mexican American. There were no white kids in those schools. And conversely, there were no more Mexican kids on the east side of Delano schools, right? Jaime Crow. The legacies of Jaime Crow. And again, it was not just Kern. So I had to show evidence that this was widespread. In fact, so much so that the United States Commission on Civil Rights, for the first time now, comes to the Southwest, Texas and California in particular, to find out about all of the violations, the abuses that these minorities, particularly in Mexican Americans in the state of California, are, have experienced and are experiencing. So they, they, they published a series of, of uh, pamphlets about the segregation and, and discrimination faced by Mexican American students in the public schools. It's called the Excluded Student Educational Practices Affecting Mexican Americans in the Southwest. They said this, the denial of equal opportunity by exclusionary practices. And they went on, the dominance of Anglo values is, is apparent in the curriculum of all educational levels in the cultural climate which ignores or denigrate Mexican American mores and the use of Spanish language in the exclusion of the Mexican American community from full participation in matters pertaining to school policies and practices. So it might be housing that you're excluded and again it's a problem. It might be the schools. But there are other issues that were now galvanizing Mexican Americans and African Americans, and in the post-World War II areas, we refer to them as the white racial liberals. These are the, the, the white liberals that are joining the ranks of Mexican American and African American and Japanese American civil rights organization pressing for change. In 1947, the state, uh, state, uh, California state legislature bans discrimination on the basis of race. First state in the country to do so, right? So it was in the forefront. And those racial liberals are now going to places like Kern and getting together with the Mexican Americans and African American colleagues to pressure inclusion, to ask, to pressure the, against the educational ex exclusion of their, of their children. And another really sticky issue that is current throughout the 20th century still is here, right? You, you know it better than I do, although I've seen a lot of articles about it. Police brutality issues and minority communities, Mexican American and African American. This on the left is the Community Service Organization, the first civil rights organization uh, founded in California in 1947 to defend the rights of Mexican Americans. It had chapters up and down the state and one of the very active chapters was here in, in um, Bakersfield. Uh, by the way, anyone that can see, anyone of note in, yes, Cesar Chao is in the front, and if you look on, on your left, uh, the fellow in the front there in the dark suit, that's Edward Royal. He's the first Mexican-American elected to Congress um, out of the state of California in 1950, somewhere in 1950. First Los Angeles City Councilman in the 20th century representing a population of about 600,000 Mexican-Americans, and there hadn't been a Mexican-American elected to the City Council of Los Angeles with the largest Mexican origin population in the United States until 1949. Right. And there are a few other notable. Fred Ross, one of the racial white liberals who was absolutely instrumental in helping found the CSO. He was also involved in that Mendes case I told you about in school desegregation in 1947 Orange County. These are the types of guys that are joining with Mexican-American political advocates and African-American political advocates and other places in California, Japanese-American uh, civil rights advocates to create change. But police brutality was an issue that was really germane. One of the important if you think about the legs of the civil rights advocacy and debate about what these groups were contending with, yes, it was education, it was voting, uh, it was housing, and it was police brutality. Um, I mentioned the, the difficulty of labor, labor activism in the fields from the 30s to 40s into the 50s into the 60s. Um, 
That was still fresh in people's minds. The CSO, Community Service Organization, joins with the NAACP, with the U.S. Department of Justice, and in 1957, they go after one Bakersfield policeman in particular who is well known to be unbelievable harasser of kids of color, especially Mexican-Americans. Um, and they had, again, they had a long record of police brutality with repeated cases, uh, repeated complaints and protests by various Mexican-American individuals. They are actually, this is rare, even rarer then than it is now, to have a grand jury indict, prosecute, and convict a policeman. But this case was so obvious and oftentimes so brutal that it provoked a grand jury to, to indict and convict a uh, Bakersfield uh, police officer. 1960s resuscitates this all over again with the United Farm Workers Movement. You know, it, it, was, it was a contested movement, right? Management and ownership of the farms, they didn't want a labor union. Some of them remembered about the 30s and 40s and 50s, and they were going to try to stop it, right? And there was a lot of violence in the field, so much so that it attracted the U.S. Uh, Senate Subcommittee on Migratory Labor, <laughs> headed by Robert F. Kennedy, the brother, brother of the president. He comes to Kern County, to Delano, to establish a hearing to find out what's going on here. We're hearing about all kinds of things going on here. And he has this now infamous exchange with the Kern County Sheriff Roy Galen. I'd like to play a, a video of this, but it would take too long. But here's the gist of it. Robert Kennedy asks, do you take pictures of everyone in the city in Delano? Sheriff says, well, if he's on strike or something like that. Then he goes on, he says, well, if, if I have reason to believe that there's going to be a riot started and somebody tells me that there's going to be trouble if you don't stop them, then that's my duty to stop them. And Kennedy's hesitating. He says, you go out there and you arrest them? And the sheriff says, absolutely. The exchange continues. Kennedy says, who told you that they were going to riot? The sheriff says, the, the man right out there in the field that, that they were going uh, talking to said, if you don't get them out of here, they're going to cut their hearts out. And Kennedy says, ah, oh, this is the most interesting concept, I think, that you suddenly hear talk about somebody's going to get out of order, perhaps violate the law, and you go in and you arrest them, and they haven't done anything wrong? How do you go arrest somebody if they haven't broken the law? And the sheriff says, well, they are ready to violate the law, and laughter breaks out in, in, the, in the hearing. In other words, right? Then there was a moment of silence, and this was the, the closer when Kennedy said, could I suggest that in the interim period of time, in the luncheon period of time, that the sheriff and the district attorney read the Constitution of the United States? So I wanted to share that with you because now it, it's quite infamous exchange. But it tells a story that's that, about what's going on in the um, violence in the fields and in town. So Robert Power, so I came across this article, too, in this, this story. The former police chief of Bakersfield in the 1960s, he was quoted in the Fresno Bee saying, uh, Bakersfield was sociologically a backward racist community. It is also a place where police can be used to harass private citizens. The former police chief of Bakersfield in, with this kind of indictment against the police department? Story very briefly. His son was on the police department, so he follows daddy into the police department. And the son turns out, in a case of harassment against some African-American youth, he breaks the code of silence in the police department. And he says, These, my colleagues actually did this. He was harassed incessantly. Dad and son were both stopped all the time on the streets by the Bakersfield PD in a way to continue to harass them. So this is where this, this quote comes from. But it, again, it, it expresses the problem, the problem of race and the criminal justice system. And this is something U.S. Commission on Civil Rights in 1970, again, coming into the Southwest in places like Southern California and South Texas and Arizona and other places, uh, Colorado, and, and trying to, to determine there's problem in the criminal justice system, uh, in law enforcement system, um, in, across the land. 
and they had this to say. Um, we, the, the commission, undertook this study against the background of written complaints and allegations at commission hearings at, and in meetings of the commission state advisory committee that Mexican Americans in the Southwest were being subjected to discrimination by agencies of law enforcement and in the administration of justice. And it later found widespread evidence that equal protection of the law and the administration of justice is being withheld from Mexican Americans. Our investigations reveal that Mexican-American citizens are subject to unduly harsh treatment by law enforcement officers, that they are often arrested on insufficient grounds, receive physical and verbal abuse, and penalties which are disproportionately severe. So it was a problem in Bakersfield. It was a problem in Kern County. It was a problem in Southern California. It was a problem across the region. And then the other part of civil rights advocacy, something that they were trying to change. Again, community service organization, NAACP. This is not a picture of a local NAACP office. I couldn't find one. Um, but they are now basically saying, we're here. We don't have a political voice. We want you to listen to us. And we want to try to elect people that if you don't represent us, if you don't listen to us, We'll vote in our own people. And so it be, it's the beginnings of a civil rights movement that has several appendages. Fight police harassment, try to break down educational segregation, and get political representation. So they are intent in doing this through the, the, the 50s and 60s. The, the NAACP and CSO come together. They, they argue for the development of what's called the Intergroup Relations Board. It's supposed to be advisory to the city council, but it's enormously frustrated. The people on the IRB are enormously frustrated over time because they're arguing city council and Kern County Board of are not listening to them and to their complaints, especially around employment and school segregation cases. No surprise in 1957 that those would be really critical issues. They form another group, the Kern Council for Civic Unity, the KCCU. Again, issues, fair housing, employment, and educational discrimination. Again, no surprise there. Those become the critical issues for advocacy for change. And in 1965, the Civil Rights Movement comes full force to Bakersfield. The first large demonstration and march in Bakersfield. And what shocks the members of the KCCU and, and the IRB is that in response to that march, the rise of what's called white citizens' councils. Now, there weren't white citizens' councils for the most part in California. They are the, they're the product of the civil rights, the response to the civil rights initiatives, the black freedom struggle in the South. They were everywhere in the South to basically either halt, harass, or repress civil rights initiatives at the local level. And when the NAACP and the IRB and the, and the council see that a white citizens council has now been formed, they go to the city council and say, how can this be? We want you to censure this group. For anyone knowing about civil rights, white citizens council struck fear in your heart because this is the group that unleashed enormous uh, violence against civil rights activists, especially in the South. This group hadn't done that here, but the fact that they were in Bakersfield and in Kern County um, raised a lot of problems. They went to the city council. They said the only issue before the city council was a simple request by the intergroup relations board the minority spokesman uh, declared at the council meeting, that the council publicly state that the city does not welcome pro-segregationist organizations, whether they be black or white, or to state further that the city opposes recruiting by Mississippi-based white supremacists. City council, nope, that's not our jurisdiction. No censure. This fueled even greater dismay on the part of, um, of these activists. And then they said, well, all right, you don't listen to us. We're going to go with a ballot box. We're going to elect our own. And they began to do so by the 1970s. They promote the first candidates. The council promotes the first candidates of color in Bakersfield and in other places in Kern County. First African-American uh, person to sit on the uh, Bakersfield City School District. The first Mexican-American to be elected to the um, state assembly 
uh, Raymond Gonzalez in 1972. Big deal, right? First Mexican American to have state uh, uh, state office from from the county. But there was a, a significant reaction to Gonzalez, and two years later, the Republican Party, joined by several other constituencies, um, are, be, are, are, are be able to are, are able to thwart the reelection of Gonzalez um, with the help of you know a lot, lot of help. Um, William Bill Thomas, who defeated Gonzalez in, in 1974, after he took his seat in the state assembly. And I was actually taken aback when I saw this statement. This is a man sitting in the state assembly, right, in 1974, and he, has said, he said this, Kern County has a vested interest in keeping people where they are, especially racially, and instituting minimal change. This was the state representative coming out of this area. This is 1974. And uh, add insult to injury in the wake of the election, uh, the, the editor, Ted Fritz of the Californian, described Bakersfield as, quote, the most harmoniously segregated community in America. Flowery language. Uh, there is absolutely no crossing of racial and cultural lines, he claimed, adding, many prominent businessmen here literally deny the existence of blacks and Mexican Americans. Their problems don't exist because they don't exist. There's a reason that um, historian Oliver Rosales in a PhD dissertation out of the University of California, Santa Barbara, titled his dissertation Mississippi West. He was talking about Kern County and the Central Valley when it came to all these things which I've mentioned about Jaime Crow. Gonzalez's defeat took the number of Mexican Americans of the 181 elected and appointed officials in Kern County there was only one, and once he was defeated in re-election, it went back to zero. It attracts the uh, attention of the, again, the State Advisory Committee to the United States Commission on, Civ on Civil Rights in 1971 when they say Kern County had among the lowest of all counties in the state of Mexican-American elected officials. So the legacies of Jaime Crow continued. And the commission had this to say, while it is generally accepted public belief that the Mexican-American community is victimized by racist attitudes to the degree that other minorities are, the committee found that racism has been a major factor in denying the Mexican-Americans access to our political and government institutions in California today, mid, you know, early, early 70s. For many years, in spite of large and continually growing numbers in California, Mexican-Americans have been conspicuously absent from government positions in the state. This has been true at all levels. Again, not just Bakersfield, not just Kern County, all of California, all of the Southwest. All right, let me share with you what for me was an interesting experience testifying in the U.S. District Court in the Luna case. I've been involved in several of these cases for the last 30 years. And this one uh, was quite unique. So I could tell that U.S. District Court Judge Droz, he was listening. And I've been in some of these cases when the judge, you know, is either falling asleep, well, not that bad, uh, but maybe not really pay This judge was paying attention to the historical context. I could see it in his eyes. I could see it in his body language. And then some things happened in the context of my testimony that reinforced my initial hunch that he was really paying attention and it was having an impact on him. This was the first time in a civil in a voting rights case when, when I'm serving as the expert historian that the opposing counsel did not hire one, two, or three other historians to contest every word, every sentence that I wrote. They didn't hire a historian. So they really had no idea how to contest my historical narrative. But they tried. So I would talk about some of these things that I've, I've told you, and they'd stand up. Your Honor. Um, Professor Camarillo, uh, we, we, we object. Professor Camarillo has cited um, a book that was published in the 1930s. He looks at him, objection overruled. Two minutes later, I'm talking about something. 
Objection, Your Honor. Professor Camarillo has cited a newspaper article from 1959. He looked at it. Objection overruled. Another case. So this goes on. I mean, I testified for eight hours, something like that, six hours. Five, six, seven objections. Sit down, basically overruled. Finally, finally, and of course the MALDEF attorneys know how to work this, right? They're real pros. So every time they're objecting, they, Professor Camarillo, can you tell us how a historian goes about his or her work in fashioning historical analysis and historical narrative? Well, of course, we use primary uh, records when there's, when there's published information and articles and books and other things and governmental uh, reports. We use that as well. And we use the, uh, our ethical standards of professional historians. We're not cherry-picking sources. We're putting the sources together and telling a narrative, right? based upon our professional training. So the last time that the opposing counsel said, objection, your honor. Professor Cameron, this is hearsay. So they're, they're telling the judge that everything that I have written and I have testified in that court is hearsay because it's one step removed from the source. The judge, he's exasperated this time. He looks at the counsel, says, counsel, and I paraphrase, this is really aggravating. What do you think historians do? How do you think they tell their stories? They never asked another objection after that. In other words, in his own way, he put them in their place. I'd never seen that in a courtroom. It was fun. <laughs> um, and then, of course, uh, you had... Oh, here, here's what he says in, his, in this finding. The court finds Dr. Camarillo's testimony to be compelling evidence of a history of discrimination against Latinos in Kern County and in the broader region. Consideration of this factor weighs heavily in the plaintiff's favor. So he knew that Jaime Crow had legacies that were continuing into the late 19th, into the 20th century and into the 21st century. History just isn't something abstract, right? It's still affecting people's lives. And as other expert witnesses come to tell the story, and using a lot of numbers about how the Kern County Board of Supervisors drew their, their boundaries and how it diluted the Latino vote, all of that was this comprehensive um, information, right? Uh, the totality of circumstances and totality of evidence that a judge takes into consideration, including history. And by the way, he said this. Defendants contend that Dr. Camarillo's testimony regarding historical evidence of discrimination statewide is irrelevant because it does not focus exclusively on discrimination occurring within Kern County. The court rejects such a myopic view. That, that was pretty powerful. Evidence of statewide discrimination is clearly relevant and may provide context for understanding understanding the instances of discrimination within the political subdivision at issue. The other series of objections, at least five or six, we object, Your Honor, Professor Camarillo's talking about Los Angeles County, and he kind of rubbed his head, overruled. Uh, I'd be talking about uh, something that happened in San Diego or San, Santa Barbara, some other place, right? Objection, Your Honor, that occurred. At so, you know, he's just shaking his head, and finally, um, they didn't ask that anymore. And, what does it become? Part of the official ruling. That was fun too. But the other part of the story from the personal perspective is about Maldef. In particular because it really warms my heart. 50 years. It's anniversaries this year. 50 years. The first civil rights advocacy group based on legal work, right, legal work in the courts. Started out as a model of, of the um, African American legal model, if you will, and over time develops an incredible capacity to take these cases. And let me tell you, these cases are really difficult. They're complicated. It's as, just as easy for you to lose a case like this than to win. And over time, the Supreme Court's made it more difficult for these cases to be successful. They cost millions of dollars to prosecute. 
if you lose, if, if the plaintiffs lost this case, Maldef would have to have absorbed probably a million and a half dollars. Do you know how much it costs you folks as taxpayers for the Board of Supervisors to hire that consul that was charging them, I don't know, $500 an hour, something like that? I have not seen the estimate, but it was in the millions of dollars. Was it five? Is that what they said? They not only had to pay all their legal fees, they had to pay off of Maldef. Right? Um, there were five attorneys on Maldef, all women. All women. And they were so prepared, so professional, in comparison to the, the uh, counsel for the defendants, they blew them out of the water. Right? To see that 50 years later, a product of a movement for social change 50 years ago, longer, that now has the basis when the case is right and the evidence is there to prosecute a case to make it easier for people to vote and to have their vote count. That for me is an object lesson of change over time. And I remember advising Maldef way back early on in the first few years of its, of its uh, development because they were bringing in the few, there were very few academics at that time in, in the um, mid-70s that were giving them counsel about, you know, what, what are the things that we could do as academics to help your cases if you move forward with school desegregation cases or voting rights cases. So 50 years later, it, it, it really is a, it's a wonderful legacy to see how social change social justice before the law can, can mature and have an impact on the lives of people here in your county. It is about maps. That map was redrawn. There's now an excellent opportunity for a second Latino or Latina to be elected to the Kern County Board of Supervisors because the court demanded that those districts be redrawn with the totality of evidence that was compiled by the plaintiffs and prosecuted by, by Maldef. But for me, it's bigger than maps. It's nothing short of the broadening of American democracy, right? Making it possible for people to exercise their right as American citizens, to have the opportunity to elect people that they believe will represent them and that they will have a voice at the local level in this case, the county level. So for me, it really is about the victory of democracy um, in Kern counties. And I'm going to end on that note. Thank you very much. Okay, so so we, have, we have some time for questions if you have any, and I'm, I'm glad to, uh, to answer. Yes. Oh, you're all or Oliver. Okay, very good. I want to thank you for lecturing. I was listening to your presentation. Can you tell me about how you thought about this case? I didn't know. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're you're cited cited widely. Yeah, good, good point, Oliver. And again, thank, thank you for. It, there was one dissertation, doctoral dissertation that I could refer to, and I scoured the uh, the bibliographic sources. It was Oliver's dissertation, very well done, out of the University of California, Santa Barbara, and it allowed me to go to some of those sources that you used and and to take a look at them and and inquire, inquire further, right? But it's a good question because you know this better than 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 I do about Kern County. And this is true of the central, the history of the Central Valley and the Central Valley's largest ethnic minority, Mexican Americans. There is so little in the historical record that's published about the history of Mexican Americans in the Central Valley. Now, not true if you go to a place like Los Angeles or you go to a place like San Jose, um, other cities of the Southwest. 
there's a very substantial, as you know, very substantial, we call historiography, li historical literature on Mexican Americans and other ethnic and racial minorities in those cities. But in the rural areas, we don't have it. We have to build it. And it has to be people from the local area um, saying, we need to collect the, the testimonies of people, the older generation, before they go on, because that testimony is very important, oral histories. We have to gather records wherever we can find them and house them in a place that's accessible, especially for our young people to access them for educational purposes. Right? I'm working a group with a group right now in Silicon Valley. It's called La Raza uh, Historical Society of Santa Clara County. They're doing exactly that because, yes, they have Stanford nearby, and we have this massive, massive collection on the Mexican-American experience, right? But it's not in the local community. There's a role to play in local communities for a university to help facilitate that process of archi archival collection and making use of that archival collection for students and the public at large. So it's not an easy thing to do. But there, it, it needs to be done. And I'm hoping, well, of course, all these voting rights records are public records, right? Uh, anyone can access them. Uh, we'll have the, we have the MALDEF archives at, uh, at Stanford's Department of Special Collections, so all that material there historically is there. But there needs to be something locally. So I hope, I hope some people might get motivated to start thinking what you might do here to promote the history of Mexican-Americans and others in the county um, that would allow for an educational environment to kind of grab hold. So thanks for that question. Yeah, I do Alicia. think that our library, our, our Dino Library, Kurt Asher, and the University Archivist, uh, Chris Livingston, have done a phenomenal job in really pulling in a lot of records here that, that should have been here for a long time. Uh, and so uh, Kurt, And, and, and you know, that warms my heart to know the university is doing that. And we know that there's limited resources for libraries to do that. Uh, and here's where the public at large can really help uh, university libraries and to say, you know, we are on the receiving end of this. Our students are coming here. And we think that X, Y, and Z should be represented in your collections. We approve and, and applaud what you're doing. And we think you should be doing more, right? Sometimes it's a collaboration between local historical societies and, and university libraries, but uh, it's something that um, having come here in the summer months, by the way, July and August, you guys, it's hot here, right? Uh, but uh, having come here and realized that my task as an expert witness, I'd have to generate a lot of primary sources because you couldn't turn to the books, right? A dissertation, yes. Your article, yes. But not a whole lot beyond, beyond that. So anytime you have an archival source that allows, whether it's a student or someone coming in to, to uh, try to write a, a historical narrative about whatever it might be, um, it's important to have it locally. So I'm glad the library is, is doing work yeah, here as well. Yeah, and you know, when I remember when your student first contacted me, then we talked in uh, the summer of 2016 at Stanford. Uh, We had that con exactly. We had that conference. There's not a hole out there that you you can turn to, right? So you have to do. And, and, but this is also the fun part of it, the laborious part of it. You have to dig for those sources, and you're creating the historical narrative, right? So hopefully, the the little piece that I you know, the, the 37 page report that that I uh, gave to the court, which is my my testimony, and which is now a historical record. That can serve as a basis for other people. Uh, and if they look at Oliver's dissertation, there are other leads there that allow you to open up uh, to other topics that could open up the history, right? And that reminds me, you sent me your, your, your PowerPoint earlier in the week, and I thought it was, I think, dynamic, because I, I keep looking at it. I want to find you tell me how you did that stuff with the fading, and, and that's wonderful. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, several years ago, and I wish I had uh, uh, remembered to send it after you showed it, 
imagine being in a similar talk to elsewhere, but a, uh, uh, an ad, a brand new craft, this is 1921 or 22, uh, Caucasians only. And so I wish I had remembered this because it was a, a, an ad. It, it says exactly where the new housing is and all the amenities, right. Caucasians only. Right. Yeah, not unique to yeah, Bakersfield yeah. or Kirk County. It was everywhere, yeah. right? It yeah. was everywhere. So you had a question in the back. So, so did everyone hear that? Uh, the, you know, there's there's a debate going on right now. I mean, they're they're in court as we talk um, about um, whether there's going to be a question about citizenship in the 2020 census. Right? It's being contested, um, and it does have implications for voting. Right? Because a lot of people will argue that it will suppress the total enumeration of particularly immigrant-based populations, Asian and Latino, right? So that they're arguing, there's already, we know this historically, there's already a, <coughs> excuse me, two to four percent undercount of minority populations generally across the United States every census year going back whenever, right? So what some people argue, this is going to further suppress those numbers and going back to a voting rights case, right? The numbers allow you to determine if you're going to maintain or modify jurisdictional boundaries for voting areas, right? For jurisdiction, voting jurisdictions. So it does, it will have an impact and we don't know where this is gonna go. I mean, as of yesterday, I know that they, um, several of the I shouldn't get into this because it takes us off in a direction, but it has implication that um, there are several legal groups coming together to an attorney general of many states that are going to federal court for an injunction against that, basically to halt it, right? But the Trump administration really wants it, right? And so they're arguing very, very uh, fervently for incorporating. We'll see where it goes. Yes. You know, it's really complicated how they're drawn. Um, if you see the reports of the people that, that basically churn the numbers, right, to get at how best to design representation, uh, given all kinds of complexities taken into consideration, uh, it's, there's algorithms, there's all kinds of math. Don't even ask me how to... <laughs> but but they but they the process has to go before the court and in this case the the judge says all right county board of supervisors come together with legal counsel let's decide um, which of these maps proposed maps makes most sense um, there were three maps originally proposed by Maldon right as ways you could uh, form these districts that made more sense and didn't dilute the Latino vote. Um, County Board of Supervisors agreed to one of them, right? And it turned out actually better than, than MALDEF had anticipated. So, uh, but it is a complex, a complex mathematical um, um, consideration of how you put all these factors together to draw these districts. Yes. Joaquin Avila, um, longtime attorney and at one point general counsel and president of MALDEF, long, long dear friend of mine passed away, um, I guess it was last year or the year before. Here was a guy that devoted his entire life to voting rights cases. And even after he, in fact, he left MALDEF to 
almost single-handedly prosecute cases, voting rights cases, um, up and down the state of California, Watsonville, Monterey County, other places. Um, without resources, right? And for a while, he won a MacArthur Genius Award that helped, gave him a little money to, but as the U.S. Supreme Court over time made it more difficult for voting right cases to be successfully prosecuted, he was bankrupting himself, right? Here's a case of a man that had enormous legal training, great legal training, uh, was totally committed to this as a public servant and as an attorney, and had bankrupted him. He was poor, really, throughout his life, his adult life after he left Maldiv, because he put every penny he had mortgaged his house, lost his house to prosecute these cases. For me, Joaquin Avila is a hero, a true hero of the Latino civil rights uh, history of this country. And so uh, he's also a guy that came from the hood with me. He was, turns out, we didn't realize this till he was president and, and uh, general counsel of Maldef. He grew up two streets over from me in the barrio of Compton. We didn't go to the, we went to the same school as elementary school students, but we didn't know each other. And then our paths were kind of like parallel and they came together and we realized, hey man, you're from Compton. Um, it, it was a real joy to know this man. And things are gonna be written about Joaquin Avila because if you could think about the great African American legal minds that were behind the great achievements for African Americans, you, you, you put the term Mexican-American, Joaquin Avila will be in that, uh, in, in that pantheon of, of great heroes and leaders that fought the good fight. So thank you for, for bringing up his name. Last question, yes ma'am. Right, there, this was a, a, a victory for, on, on the Voting Rights Act for the plaintiffs, right? And for Maldef and for the uh, Latino community and for American democracy, as I mentioned. But it's really hard to fight these cases. The struggle goes on. You mentioned uh, the Dakotas. There, there's one I learned about and I hadn't known about it, but it goes on for 40 years in Waller County, Texas. Um, it is very hard and the uncanny ability of certain jurisdictions that don't want to change and they're going to fight it tooth and nail and always come up with new devices to dilute the vote, gerrymandering in a new form, right? So we're still living that struggle and that history. But what happens if in a few years a voting rights case comes to be before the Supreme Court? And you're right. There's been an erosion of some of the most important provisions um, of the original Voting Rights Act. The pre-clearance is one of them, right? Just quickly, a jurisdiction that's been found to be uh, not complying uh, with the Voting Rights Act, before the next election, they'd have to come up and submit to the Department of Justice Voting Rights Division the plan that will allow all voters to be uh, treated fairly uh, in that district. That was eliminated by the Supreme Court. Some of these old jurisdictions that had lost cases years ago have come back to reinstitute, as you say, voter repression, voter dilution, uh, policies and practices that kind of take, you, you take one step forward and then some of these take you three steps back, right? So it is an ongoing struggle, but I fear, I fear now because you know there's going to be a Voting Rights Act 
That's going to be contested. That's going to go to the Supreme Court probably within the next two years. We could see the end of the Voting Rights Act. I mean, that, that is the worst case scenario, but it's a very real possibility. Or, or so eroded that it has no meaning. But in California, we have the California Voting Rights Act. It's way easier to prosecute a case with the California Voting Rights Act that strikes at voter dilution and gerrymandering. You don't have to provide the same kind of very detailed uh, analysis that the federal act does. So in California, we're protected in a lot of ways, but not in, in the majority of states across the country. Thank you, folks, for coming. And uh, again, I want to thank everyone for, for inviting me today. I want to, again, thank uh, Dr. Camarillo, thank all of you for coming, and I just want to remind you about the segment that will be airing on KCET, Divide and Conquer. This will be October 23rd, 8 p.m., and it will deal with the case, and you are uh, on, on that as well, right? You're speaking on that as well. Uh, also, one, two last things. Uh, in the spring, in your program, we will, be, uh, we will be welcoming Dr. Mario T. Garcia from the University of California, Santa Barbara, to talk about his latest work, and it's in there. And then tomorrow, the Public History Institute is doing a conference in the trenches. There are flyers in the back. Thank you all again. Again, especially thank you for making the trip here and coming. It was our pleasure to host your visit. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.